and get some water. The boys for the night. We are on grazing land somewhere not far from I-15 in Montana. Elk! Look at that. Just missed it. I think it was closer. Oh. It's an elk. It's an elk. Hi, elk. Jump. Jump. There you go. Nice. I think I called them all. They're all coming down now. The real cow whisperer. Look at that. Little hair. Hi, Bugs Bunny. Lima, Montana. After a couple days in the backcountry, it's nice to see civilization. Okay, I keep seeing people commenting that Cyril's horses look fine. They're older horses. That's what older horses look like. No. So here are a few of the ranch horses we keep around. That's Mini Horse. She's a halflinger. She's pushing probably 18 or 19. Out there, you may be able to see her in the distance. That's Petunia. She's a paint. She showed up in about 2010. That was 13 years ago, and she was about 6. So she's pushing 20 also. She's probably 19. This is Fred. He's a retired rope horse we keep around for the kids. Ironically, he doesn't like the kids. Uh, but plump and happy, also pushing 20, maybe older. The one that's not nice and fat is also 33 years old and missing teeth. Do you know how hard it is to keep weight on a horse without teeth? And somehow the old man still looks better than Falcon and Pete. So let's get into it. Oh, Sweet Cheeks USA. This summer fling has been fun. Okay, so we've all seen this update, right? I want to talk about this whole he's selling the horses thing. 
In the form you have to fill out to request to buy one of these horses, he asks you to make him an offer on whatever horse you want and that he doesn't want anything less than five figures, which for those who don't understand, that is $10,000 per horse. Let's not forget that he already turned out an offer of $20,000 for just Falcon before Pete came into the picture. And he told another person he would take 60 k and they had to sign an NDA. So I'm really curious as to what he thinks these horses' values really are because he clearly doesn't understand what gives a horse a value, especially in the different markets. For example, this is what a $60,000 hunter jumper horse looks like. Notice the amazing body condition on this guy. But you're right, Falcon and Pete are not hunter jumper horses. As far as Cyril is concerned, they're endurance horses, right? They're long riding horses. So let's look at what a valuable long riding horse or endurance horse looks like. When looking up endurance horses online, this is one of the first things that popped up from Dream Horse. Uh, this horse is $20,000, but even in this tiny little picture, you can see how much better of a body condition they have than both Falcon and Pete. Here is a proven safe endurance and trail horse for seventeen five. It's an Arabian. It's a uh, 2013, what is that? 10 years old, there's some math for you. <laughs> This horse has a little bit more of a lean body condition, but it's an Arabian. They are a more lean horse. So other than that, you know, it looks like a pretty healthy horse for 17.5. Then I went to Facebook to look up endurance horses for sale on there. And my findings were a lot different. This horse has competed in endurance races, two of them, and is 13 years old, 14.3, 5,500. A close-up of this horse to see the amazing body condition they are in. Pause to read, but here's the ad for another horse, a little bit older, a little bit taller, five gates, um, and is covering 25 plus miles a week. Kind of hard to see, put it on clear mode, but at the bottom there it says mid four figures, which means less than 10,000. Here's that horse. Very good body condition. It does seem to be a little ribby right here, but it's got muscle and fat. It's got a nice round rump. This horse looks really good. Less than $10,000 is a conditioned endurance horse. Again, pause to read. This was the highest price horse I could find. And if you look down at the bottom, it's $8,000 for this cute little Mustang. This horse is worth 8,000, but these guys are worth 10 or more each. Good afternoon everybody. I'm taking a little break from riding because it's gotten over 100 degrees and I don't want these horses to suffer because of it. But uh, we all know that uh, Cyril is now trying to sell the two horses he does have for five figures and get another. Uh, it's worth noting he'll also accept automobiles and real estate of all kinds. Sell him that quarter foot of acreage you have in Arizona. He'll love it. So today we're going to talk about what gives a horse value. As a horse trainer, my job is threefold. I train for the public, I coach and give lessons, and I buy and sell for customers. So while the training and the showing is my favorite part of the business, at times the buying and selling is the more important aspect. All right, say a customer tells me, hey, I'm looking for a horse to show in the cow horse, or I'm looking for a broke trail horse, or I'm looking for something to show in the reining, or I just want a pasture pet. The valuation is gonna be different based on the goal. The first thing I'm always gonna look at though, regardless of the goal, is does the horse's training fit that customer's goal? I'm not gonna buy something unstarted for a customer that's two if that customer's thinking, you know, I'd really just like something that I can take out next weekend after I've bought the horse and go ride around the pasture and check cows. That's not gonna I'm also not gonna get something that's a level four non-pro cow horse if that customer just wants something to sit in the pasture. Now that I can say is probably the only good thing about the horses Cyril has. They seem to be pretty broke. They haven't bucked him off yet that we know of. They seem like they're easy to get along with. So that to me is about the only place these horses have value. The second thing I'm gonna look at is body condition. Are these horses fit? Are they lame? Are they in good shape? What are we looking at here? Now, we already know based on what we've seen from Cyril's own Instagram stories and posts on TikTok, both of these horses are pretty lame and significantly underweight. If you're selling a horse for five figures, that horse better look good and move well. The only exception is if you're selling them as a broodmare. 
you can have a broodmare that's pasture sound and can't be ridden and can still be worth a significant amount of money if they've produced or if their sire and dam produced and they haven't had a foal yet. At this point, I think it's worth noting that Cyril's horses are never going to make good breeding geldings. So in terms of Falcon and Pete, we lose money there. That brings them under what he thinks their value is. Both horses are in horrible condition and horribly lame. So one other thing that I look at in my realm is parentage. So while papers aren't everything, papers can increase a horse's value significantly. These are papers for a mare that I sold last year for mid five figures. They're a good set of papers. Hickory Holly Time on the top and Mr. Nick Duel on the bottom. Both parents produced. Without those, that mare's value drops significantly. And papers are not everything as previously stated, but when you have a good set of papers, you can hedge your bets on what that offspring is going to do. If both parents earned and both parents produced, you're taking less of a risk buying something out of that parentage than you would be otherwise on a great horse that you don't know the parent. So let's go back and touch up on soundness again, because there's one last thing I want to say about this. So both horses are lame. Both horses are underweight. When horses are underweight, things start shutting down. When horses are lame, you're basically required to do maintenance. So when it comes to that, you're looking at thousands of dollars of vet care required just to get these horses comfortable again. There's no telling if you'll get them sound enough to actually ride comfortably again, because as of right now, they don't look to be that way. Now, the takeaway from that and the point I want to impress on you guys is he's asking at least 10 grand for each horse. If you have to turn around and throw $2,500 to another 10 grand into these horses to get them sound, potentially, because there's no guarantee they'll ever be sound again, they're obviously not now, then it's such a waste of money. And I understand we all want these horses off the road, but we're not going to take the problems he caused and reward him for causing them. That is absolutely asinine. So in closing, I just hope we've learned something about the valuation of horses today and why he is absolutely ridiculous for asking five figures for these horses. Yes, we all feel bad for him. Yes, we all want this over. But let's not reward his negligence with financial benefit. That is ridiculous. Y'all have a good day. So this is it. After months of thinking about it and carefully training and preparing. Not many understand how fun it is to be mounted on the back of a horse traveling thousands of miles across many states meeting all kinds of people and traveling through the seasons it's so much fun that i've been doing it for a decade the motivations for this man's journey are confusing to me but i'm not here to hate so i'm just going to share how i travel logistically circumstances and nature are boss they're in charge no matter what idea i have i'm always going to have to compromise and adjust to the landscape and the conditions his goal is almost 2,000 miles in 100 days that sounds very stressful. You can travel 25 miles every day, but that doesn't mean you're gonna have a camp every 25 miles. I don't sit up for the night unless there's grass and water. That could be six miles. That could be 32 miles. And you can almost double the amount of miles that you're gonna do because you can't just take the freeway or the highway. You have to go over the river and through the woods and mountain miles are way longer than straight miles. It takes about four years to condition a horse to become an endurance athlete, which is what's required of them to meet that kind of goal. A riding horse is for riding, a pack horse is for packing, and it's not a good idea to mix those, especially when asking so much of the animal. Personally, I have two pack horses. One is specifically for tools, the other is specifically for food. And with that, I can be out over two months at a time without seeing town. I carry my own shoeing gear and equipment and tools to maintain my own horse's longevity and health in their feet. Each pack horse carries roughly 180 pounds. That's my max. The way that I travel in the springtime is always low miles because there's so much grass and so much water that you don't have to travel so far. But naturally, as the season progresses into summer, camps become further and further apart, which is a natural conditioning cycle for the horses. So as the season goes on, they're naturally well equipped to do more miles. I recommend using benchmark atlases for traveling long distance. They're expensive and bulky, but they're recreation atlases. So they include trails and springs and waterways and all the mountain passes. Highly recommended.
Now, some years I travel long distances and some years I don't. And whenever I have a long distance goal, I don't plan my route. I have a general direction and I jump water sources. Horses always come first, no matter what. I'd be very interested to see the items that he's packing. I truly can't imagine this going well without some sort of support and possibly alternative horses. Rarely do things go according to plan. Just care for the animal. They have to be the priority in their feet, their bellies, their hydration, everything. They come first. They have to, or else you're not going to make it. I wish you luck, but your journey is something that I would never do. Ever. Horses are the OG transportation. Made to move and easy to care for. Just as long as they're eating more than they're working. Each one of these critters has their own individual needs, wants, desires, and passions which makes living and traveling on horses a cooperative partnership. So while it's refreshing for some to see, it's disturbing to me because there's no other way to do it. And if you hope to keep your horses happy and healthy, belligerent lack of care is unacceptable. When it comes to big green grassy meadows, stay a couple extra days. And when it comes to gear and equipment, spend the extra money, get something proper. But most of all, keep them fed. Give them treats. Horses are simple. They just want to eat. There's no other secret to maintaining a horse's happiness, health, muscle tone, and endurance. And when they're not eating, they prefer a little munching. And when they're not eating or munching, they prefer a little snacking on the go. Your horses will take you to the ends of the earth as long as you feed them the ends of the earth. The green and grassy ends because they got big butts. Muy grande, grassy ass. Everything you need to know about Too Raw to Ride is in his handle. It's called Too Raw to Ride. He said it himself. I never owned a horse until I started living on horses. I wasn't familiar with horses. I didn't know the rigging. I certainly didn't know how to navigate. The only difference is I had somebody to show me the ropes. I wasn't out there on my own. That doesn't mean that there wasn't suffering involved. There's always a learning curve and that learning curve costs. And with green horses, green people and mountainous terrain, the learning curve is steep. Death, serious injury, or at the very least, an exorbitant amount of energy expenditure. That's what it cost. That's fine, that's basic math, it's natural. Before I ever did any long distance, spent three years going around the same mountain range, learning the ropes real well. Kind of like an apprenticeship. I didn't have a cell phone in those days, but if I did, I probably wouldn't share much because it wasn't very impressive. But the point of the journey was not to get famous or anything, it was to learn the ropes and learn them well and to continue on. I'm 10 years into my nomadic journey, so everything that I'm sharing is skill that I've honed. It is not my recommendation for anyone to just grab a horse, saddle up, and ride off into the mountains. It's not a good idea. There's a lot to it. And horses are extremely willing creatures. They will die for you. And I know my presence here online has inspired a lot of people. At least a lot of people express the want to do something similar. And it is unfortunate because I cannot take everybody on. And the chances of people teaching themselves and getting it right is low. And I didn't learn from a pack outfitter. I learned from somebody that lived on horseback for over 30 years. So I'm a rare case. 